Welcome to the Information Security Forum podcast. I'm your host, Tavia Gilbert. Right now, every individual in the United States has a very advanced covert communications platform in the palm of their hand, which wasn't true in the mid-90s. And that is presenting challenges for law enforcement. That was Leo Taddeo, former FBI agent and current CISO of Six Terra, a secure infrastructure company. In this episode of the ISF podcast, we bring you the first of three conversations with Leo and ISF Managing Director Steve Durbin. In this episode, Leo shares his unique history and career path, from the military to law to law enforcement to CISO, and discusses the challenges posed by ubiquitous technologies, Russian organized crime, and more. My name's Leo Taddeo. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer for Sixtera Technologies. We are a secure infrastructure company with a portfolio of data centers and cybersecurity solutions. My role at Sixtera is to ensure information security, compliance, product security, and global threat intelligence for information security. Uh, Prior to this role, I was the special agent in charge of cyber and special operations for the FBI in New York. In that capacity, I was responsible for cyber investigations for breaches in New York City also for infrastructure protection from a cyber point of view. And also, we uh, exercised court-authorized penetrations of adversaries in the city, and I manage those teams as well. I have a long set of experiences in government, and um, I'm gaining more experience in the private sector. And many of the basic uh, principles that I thought applied when I was in government don't necessarily apply in the private sector. So it's been a learning experience for me and continuing to learn to this day. I think it's really interesting that you began in the Marines and then Mm -hmm. practiced law as well. Right. In a way, I didn't know really what I wanted to do. (laughs) Uh, So I was born and raised in New York, and like a lot of young people, was looking for a way to make a contribution and see the world. And for me, the military, the Marine Corps, was that route. And so I joined after college. I served as a tank officer and was very happy to have that experience. I think it was a formative time in my life. And um, it's not for everyone, but it happened to be a positive uh, experience for me. After leaving the Marine Corps, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but the law always interested me. So I went to law school, graduated and practiced for a short time here in New York City. Uh, But I found that being a lawyer wasn't for me either. And the FBI was always something that I wanted to do, always, since I was a teenager. And the timing for my professional preparation to take on a position as a special agent and the FBI's need for the skill set that I presented came together at the right time in the mid-90s. And I joined as a special agent, was trained. I was, I was assigned to the New York office. I spent my field agent time. And many agents have a career that begins as a field agent somewhere. And my field time was in the New York City office in Manhattan. It was a great place. It still is the greatest place to be an FBI agent. It is the Super Bowl every day. New York is where experts in every field from medicine to entertainment to law practice. Well, that's true for criminals as well. Uh, the, the, the highest order of criminal activity, terrorism, espionage is practiced here in New York. And being an FBI agent in New York is playing in the big leagues every day. And that was for me. It was an extraordinary time in my life. And it's interesting that many of the experiences that I had in the mid-90s are um, still relevant. And some of the activity that we saw in the mid-90s forecast what we're seeing today. So in the mid-90s, I I was assigned to the Russian Organized Crime Squad. And from that perch, I got to see exactly how Russian influence campaigns operate, how Russian criminal groups launder money. And those activities are highly relevant to this day. Are they? (laughs) Oh. <laughs> also, I haven't read the news for a while. <laughs> so um, what advice I give to young people, especially young agents, is take a lot of notes because you'll look back and realize that you worked on some of the most important cases and national problems, and that won't change over time. Those problems are persistent, and uh, hard work and dedication for whether you're an FBI agent or an NYPD officer or any Secret Service, the the culture and the mission is the same. So I think it applies across a lot of different agencies, but certainly it's a concentrated effort at the FBI and more concentrated in New York. 
Mm. You make a, an interesting point that, you know, back in the mid 90s, for instance, there were a number of things that are still relevant today. Can you give us some examples of that from a cybercrime standpoint? Well, the mid 90s, the fundamental challenge for FBI agents in the mid 90s, as it is today, is the rapid change of technology. And what that meant in the mid 90s was instead of an FBI agent conducting a search warrant and pulling out a set of physical books and records, for example, in order to advance an investigation, what the FBI agent found him or herself faced with was digital evidence. And so the technology challenge was how do we continue to effectively advance investigations when we now have a different medium for the evidence we need. And we had to change our processes, we had to change our training, and we had to, of course, change the infrastructure that we had available to us because having a room full of hard drives is one thing, having seized hard drives, having the ability to extract the evidence off of those hard drives and make sense of it was another capability that needed to be built out and built out rapidly. You can imagine there are 57 field offices for the FBI and a similar number of overseas offices. You can't have a capability in just one place. You have to build a capability across the enterprise. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of transformation and the challenge of that transformation was the uh, fundamental challenge in the mid-90s. And it became more complex with the different types of media. It became more ubiquitous with more people using digital technologies to communicate and store records. And so you had more variety of evidence and more quantity of digital evidence. And that is continuing to challenge uh, law enforcement. And what we see today is the different communications channels that are available. We see encryption as a challenge. It wasn't as much of a challenge in the mid-90s. Encryption in the mid-90s was something that militaries had and sophisticated intelligence agencies had. It wasn't something that was built into a handheld device that you could buy anywhere on any corner or, right. or order online. Right now, every individual in the United States has a very advanced covert communications platform in the palm of their hand, which wasn't true in the mid-90s. And that is presenting challenges for law enforcement. So I don't see it cresting anytime soon. I don't see the technology challenges becoming easier to deal with. Uh, I think we are in an interesting time in the acceleration of change. Mm -hmm. And for an organization the size and complexity of the FBI, it is an especially challenging proposition because you can't just jettison what you have. A corporation, mid-sized to large corporation, can invest and change rapidly. And that's not true for government agencies. You cannot, for example, lose access to old records. Mm -hmm. And not even for a short period of time, not for a minute, because if an investigation arises and you need to refer back to a set of data that may be relevant, you can't wait for a server to come online Mm -hmm. next week, Mm -hmm. like you might be able to do if you're an airline. Right. Or you can't have part of the organization with a capability and the other part not have the capability. I can't have a significant tool set in New York and not have the same in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. So the technology experts at the FBI have unique challenges that I don't think companies understand. We can't just move to the cloud (laughs) the way uh, private sector companies can. We can't just swap out infrastructure and retrain or rehire a new set of agents and administrators. It just doesn't compute in government. When I was running the cyber division here in New York, I spent a lot of time explaining to CEOs and C-suites, boards, exactly what the FBI does, how they do it, and how corporations could benefit from that. Right. I think there are significant areas where the interests are the same. Uh, there are areas where perhaps they diverge. Mm-hmm. Um, and having been on both sides, I can talk about how a company thinks about preventing a breach and responding to a breach and how law enforcement thinks about preventing a breach and responding to a breach. And sometimes the um, tension between the two interests results in an impasse or maybe inactivity or lack of sharing. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's where we need to break down some barriers. But I do think that there are some incentives for corporations to cooperate, but not enough. Right. And um, law enforcement needs to continue to do it's best to make it painless uh, to cooperate with law enforcement. Can you give some examples of that? Well, in a significant breach, many corporations are concerned that involving law enforcement 
will result in their loss of control of the investigation. Right. And many times uh, the reputation damage from the appearance of either improper security or a lack of sufficient concern for security can cost the company more than the actual loss of data. Right. And so managing that communication with the public is something that many corporations are keenly interested in, rightly so. If someone else is taking action and, and taking uh, action that can lead a story in a certain direction, like the FBI conducting an investigation, that sometimes gives corporations a sense that they've lost control of the messaging, the communication. Mm -hmm. And working hand in hand with the company on what is made public and what is not made public is sometimes a simple solution to that. Right. Uh, it's not always, but in many cases, the FBI and Secret Service and other agencies that do cyber investigations are sensitive to a company's concern about appearances. And mm -hmm. where possible, uh, working with the U.S. attorney, what is made public can be managed so that there isn't an improper perception for the company. Right. Okay. There's also the, the disruption, though, isn't there? I mean, I'm thinking of one particular example. An organization I'm very familiar with had a, an incident of fraud. And so law enforcement were called in, and law enforcement, quite rightly, wanted to take away the computers, the laptops. That then went on through a quite normal process of investigation, but resulted in the equipment not being returned to the organization for, I think, it was two years mm -hmm. because it was needed as, as evidence. And I think that very many organizations don't fully understand that component of it, mm -hmm. that there is that, that amount of disruption, which, okay, is necessary because we need to investigate. But do you have any advice in, in that sort of area as to what people ought to be doing? Because, of course, that's, you know, if you're a small organization, you could suddenly lose access to a significant amount of data. Right. In my experience, it is very, very rare that law enforcement will actually have to take a physical device, whether it's a hard drive, a server of some type. Um, it almost never happens. In almost every case, what law enforcement needs can be extracted through a forensic examination or the transfer of files to um, a different medium and examined at an off-site location. There's no need to remove a server or a hard drive in order to conduct a forensic examination right. in, in almost every case. The exceptions are if there's contraband on the server. So, for example, in cases where there's child pornography, the law doesn't allow anyone to possess child pornography, and wherever it is located, it must be confiscated. Right. Similarly, if there's an insider threat where there may be some questions about whether there will be a true copy delivered, for example, if you fear one of your you know, systems admins is responsible for the loss of data or the fraud then you may not trust that person to actually download the proper log files so that you can conduct a thorough investigation. In that case, you may want to take the machine. Mm -hmm. Or if a question arises as to who touched the machine, right. and in that case, if you have to do, for example, a fingerprint examination of right. the machine, then you would perhaps have to take it. But those are extraordinarily rare cases. And in most cases where there's a remote access a compromise or some type of uh, phishing compromise, most of the evidence is digital and can be removed and transferred to law enforcement in a way that has absolutely no impact on the production systems and the company can keep operating. Right. Okay. That's good to know. Thanks for tuning in to the first of our three-part series with Leo Taddeo. Be sure to listen for our second episode, in which Leo focuses on the challenge of ransomware, cryptocurrencies, and more aspects of cybercrime. Is it easy to do? No, it's not easy to combine a cyber and a physical attack. That takes an organization. It's not something most individuals are capable on their own. And so the advantage for law enforcement is that they perhaps have a smaller subset of adversaries that they have to worry about, but they have a large attack surface. We know you'll look forward to that conversation. In the meantime, for more resources for CISOs and anyone looking to enhance the security of their business, please visit securityforum.org. And we'd like to hear from you. If there's a topic you'd like us to cover or someone you'd like us to interview, get in touch through our website or tweet us at Security Forum. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.